Good morning uh, and a very warm welcome to our webinar today, which is focused on how to streamline your joiner, mover, lever processes. The webinar is hosted by us here at ITC Secure and our partners at Microsoft this morning. I'm Mandeep Gosal. I'm the Director of Professional Services at ITC with oversight over all technical delivery and consulting services, including our cloud security and identity practices. I'm very excited to also share the stage today with Matteo Prieti from Microsoft. Matteo is a Microsoft Global Black Belt for Advanced Identity uh, for the EMEA region with over 20 years of experience in the identity space. So it's really a great privilege to have Matteo share his expertise uh, and knowledge on this topic today. So great to have you with us today, Matteo. Good morning, thank you. I'm also pleased to introduce Jason Banks, ITC's Head of Identity. Jason is ITC's very own consummate ID, uh, identity practitioner, living and breathing the practice with decades of experience delivering holistic identity solutions into blue chip, multinational, startup and public sector clients. I think it's fair to say he's seen it all from an identity perspective and has the scars to show for it. So folks, we really do have a veritable double whammy of identity subject matter expertise in one place for you this morning. So onwards, um, a few logistical points to cover off before we, we dive in. Uh, please do share any questions you might have throughout the webinar in the Q&A chat function, which you'll see on your screen. We will allocate time at the end of the webinar to answer all of your questions. Uh, we will also pose some web poll questions for, for you to answer at various points during the webinar to help gather some quick feedback, one at the beginning uh, and a couple more questions towards the end of the webinar. So with that, let's have the first web poll question to gather some quick feedback. So you'll see a window just popped up there, hopefully. Do you have a streamlined JML process in place? Join a we believe a process is in place today. If so, is it delivering the security outcomes you expect? We'll just leave it at about 15 to 20 seconds to give you a chance to have a think and hopefully give us your answer. OK, so we can see some results coming in. So um, about 69% say yes, we do have a joiner mover lever process in place, but could be improved. Um, around about just under a third of you are saying not yet implemented um, and uh, a smaller percentage are saying yes, fully implemented. Everything's working, running smoothly. So Nirvana, you've reached. Uh, it's all it's all working well. But certainly I think I think what the results are showing us here just in our very quick web poll uh, is that there is some room for improvement and some, I guess, uh, a window of opportunity to, to learn about some solutions and where where, where we could do better. Um, so when we consider the current identity landscape, we all recall how the pandemic drove a paradigm shift with remote working, which was further complicated by the hybrid nature of work and people returning to offices, meaning the removal of the traditional network perimeter and bringing identity into focus uh, as the new perimeter, posing the challenge for how to secure all of those identities, whether that be on-prem, in, in the cloud, uh, or further complicated through hybrid setups and with the proliferation of ransomware as a service which we all know about so, so well supply chain attacks oftentimes focused on overprivileged legacy and underprotected identities with multiple solutions on offer and the question of where to start organizations by no surprise have been overwhelmed by these challenges so now i'll hand over to my colleague jason who will talk us through some common those common challenges in a bit more detail thanks Wendy. So when we're out in the field and we're talking to people, what we frequently hear is some common stories that we get back from customers about why they are struggling with identity or why they, they don't really want to go near identity at the moment. So it's too expensive and we can't see the return. We're too small to need this. You know, ITC, for example, we're, we're, we're about 100 headcount at the moment. Putting in a huge expensive JML package would be overkill for our needs but we still need some of the additional features around our governance because of the nature of the work that we do. It's too hard. Frequently, we need specialist skills. We don't have time. There's too much. We don't know where to start. And this plays back to what Mandy was saying about the landscape. If you think about the things running around in identity today, we've got JML, governments, multi-factor authentication because you know we frequently find people with multiple mfa solutions in play um, we've got all sorts of validations cross checks authorizations access management where do you start um we don't have people 
and one which we are hearing increasingly now um, is we've tried to do this, but, uh, and you know, there's been a number of engagements I've been involved with recently where somebody's gone, yeah, we spent 18 months trying to do this and we couldn't get it working. So you know, it, it's not always straightforward. But hopefully we'll, through the course of the webinar, we'll be able to explain why actually we can work around this. When I think about the solutions that I was building 10, 20 years ago, we would have HR, we'd have on-premises AD, and a few other um, on-premises um, systems. Cloud wasn't really a thing all the way back then. And then we've got governance, governance being um, very important, particularly in regulated industries. Projects tended to be quite lengthy. Um, I've spent two years on an engagement before. I've spent four years on one particular engagement for central government. That gives you a significant time to value. You are going to put a lot of investment in before you start to see any benefit. It usually required niche or specialist skills, which are hard to find. Somebody like myself or, or Mateo, and there's not many of us out there. And a lot of the identity platforms, particularly the non-Microsoft ones, can be very, very expensive to acquire. And then after we've built it, we've got it all working, and even if I have to come in and build the most perfect system, somebody has to look after it. So all of the skills that are needed to look after it, maintain it, support it, troubleshoot it, find fix, you need to build up in-house as well. It's a very, really big ask taking this legacy model. So the way we tend to work at ITC is we've gone right the way back to first principles. What are we trying to do? And essentially what we're trying to do is make sure that the right actors, and I say actors for, for a good reason here, have the right access to the right resources at the right time for the right reason. It's not enough to say this is a person, it might be a service account, it might be a device. We need to understand who this actor is, what this actor is, in order to make these identity decisions and these security decisions, but also for the right time and the right reasons. Um, can I explain this? Why was Bob logging in at three o'clock in the morning and asking to be a global admin in the cloud? If I can't explain that to an auditor, I have a problem. It might be completely legitimate. Bob's coming to fix something. It might be a bad actor. I don't know. I need to be able to explain this as well. So again, going back to our general approach these days is every identity solution is unique. Um, I haven't built two the same ever. Even using standard models, standard blocks, and some out-of-the-box tools that um, we, we've had in the past. We do use standard block building blocks, standard approaches, standard components, but we tie them together because everybody does things differently. Even if you have the same HR system and the same Active Directory and the same cloud as the previous customer, you will do something slightly differently in one of those systems your processes will be different, the way that you store attributes, the things that matter to you. So we have to shape the identity solution to you rather than try and shape you to the identity solution. The other thing that we now start to say is a solution is a journey. If I start building a solution today with your requirements today, that's great. But the last thing you want to do is get 18 months in before you get any value. The other thing is, what happens in six months when somebody says, actually, we don't want to work on G Suite. We're going to pivot everything to AWS or Azure. We need to be able to pivot the solutions quickly so that the solution can come with the business and evolve over time rather than it being this big monolith that sits in the corner and becomes part of your technical debt. And the final thing to think about is that identity security enablement are all woven together. They are the same aspects of the, well, all aspects of the same coin. If you have security with no identity, you don't know who you're gatekeeping. If you have identity but haven't got a way to enforce it, you don't have security. And enablement is the hidden monster in the room because our end users need to be able to make take use of the system. It's going to be easier for the, our users to comply them to try and find a workaround because they will not because they're being malicious 
not because they're being difficult, they're trying to do their job. Equally for enablement, we need to make sure that we're not building a horrendous system for us to look after. That enablement cuts both ways. If I build the most brilliant security system that is so awful to use, nobody will go near it, it's worthless. So we need to make sure that everything we do is as simple for everybody involved, for the end users and for ourselves. Now, I've got my list of favorite quotes. Um, Identity is a new control plane from Alex Simmons at, at Microsoft. I think this is where we start to say that without identity in the modern security, particularly with the death of the perimeter, the, net, you know, the network perimeter, in the old days where we had the network, we had the firewall, everything inside the firewall was gray, everything outside was suspicious. We could use the network as the control plane. Now we have identity because we don't know who the user or where the user is. We frequently don't know who the device, what the device is or where they are in the world. We've got Peter Geelan's No Security Without Identity. Peter Geelan's an interesting one because he's part of the Jericho group who created the concept that went on to be called Zero Trust. Um, he didn't coin the phrase, that came slightly later, but the actual idea um you know trust everything you know trust nothing verify everything assume breach this came out of the work that the jericho trust were doing identity is still in concrete of modern security identity is no primitive this is all really heading to that thing where identity particularly in the modern world is actually a lot more important than we gave it credit for and i, I say that slightly tongue-in-cheek with this next slide because actually identity has been really important in our security systems for a long time i don't know i haven't been able to date this I've, I've tried to find out when the first security challenge of who goes there was but i haven't found it yet but i could imagine there being a latin equivalent to this yeah for when the romans were um, manning border forts so it is an age-old problem we're just starting to realize it today that identity is our security so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Matteo, who's going to start talking about the Microsoft elements, which will make this a lot easier for us. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody, once again, and from the reigning Italy today, strangely. And I would like just to connect to what Jason said about the journey. And uh, uh, we know, as in Microsoft, of course, um, my main role is to maximize the investments that we have uh, done during you know, the years. And uh, of course, governance is a key topic for us in the identity space. And uh, when we think about the journey, of course, we receive a really clear feedback from our customers saying about, well, OK, we love this concept of hybrid. We love this concept of thinking identity, but we had a problem you know, with the collaboration and with the governance, for instance, I mean, if, if we think about our external partners and all the partners you are involved to, it's a complicated journey to manage the collaboration in a secure way. So this is why we decided for this year to heavily invest in the governance part. Of course, we uh, already started this journey in the, in the Azure AD days. Now, you know, we love changing names and changing portals. So now we have this new Entra suite where we finally landed this new way to deal with the governance. So we actually broken down uh, the journey and uh, that Jason was mention, mentioning in these four steps that we see uh we don't see an end to be honest so we see how we start but this is something that keeps to run and uh, cycle over the years uh, just because of course you know we rely on this concept of we don't want to grant permission and access anymore directly to users we would like to rely on something more advanced like what we already did with this concept of access packages where we combine multiple uh, resources for the department and maybe involve even you know some stakeholders from the other department in order to maintain this concept of access package we rely on this now the certification where we see the needs to 
uh, recheck the access based on some compliance uh, um, um, implementation or the uh, some compliance standards that we of course implemented in in our uh, in our solution. This is how, how we see this circle, you know, that keeps running uh, throughout the years in order to keep our um, landscape secure and leverage the maximum power that we have now in, uh, in the entire governance suite. Uh, so with that, of course. If Jason, you can just change the slide for me, please. Thank you. Uh, this is how we finally decided to kind of draw <laughs> the um, what could be the classic user journey for a user. Uh, we know that we hear clearly from our customer that syncing identities is just not enough. So with that, we have now really a huge portfolio of partners, uh, mainly in the HR spaces, uh, in, in HR space where they are now uh, helping us in order to enrich and empower this flow. While, of course, we can keep syncing identities from our lovely active directory on-prem to Entra, but now we also rely on the HR integration. And why we decided to do that? Mainly because, of course, from the HR system, we can gain some really powerful insight that will then benefit the entire user journey. Because if we know when a new employee is going to join the company, we can start to do something before that date, for instance. And so with that, if you start to see how we can then combine the concept of access packages where, OK, we know that this employee uh, is going to be part of the marketing department. So instead of granting access to groups or maybe manually to some team sites or SharePoint sites, we are going to offer the new user some preset of access package, which is going to give the new employee access to a set of resources, really uh, core resource, to be honest, in, in the department. So with that, we are going to streamline and simplify also the experience from different perspectives, from the IT perspective, from the end user perspective, and always with this concept in mind that we would like to keep the entire process secure. So this is why we then rely on this concept of self-service. Of course, if you think about what is usually is going to be, what is the classic you know, journey for a new employee coming into the company, uh, he or she needs to kind of request some hardware, maybe request some access. This is the way how we're going to streamline the process directly from the HR system up to the service now request for the new hardware, for instance. This is why we see now this concept of journey that, of course, is going to finish with some um, recertification that is going to happen on some um, period based audit that the company decided to implement. So with that, when we are going to expand this kind of scenario, even with partner collaboration and this complex guest account handling that we with the, we have in the entry ID, the entire flow is going to be much more powerful and easier to manage. Because we need always to keep in mind that based on our last report, internal report researches that we uh, that we are running internally, we realize that a lot of situation where an identity was compromised is just because this identity was just you know sitting there in, in an entry ID corner somewhere and no one is taking care of the identity anymore. It means that uh, we are talking about orphan identities or you know stale identities or guest accounts that they are not active anymore. These are now the targets that. The, the, the potential attacker is trying to compromise because no one is taking care. The user is not there anymore, uh, so they can easily fish. They can easily try to you know, to, fish, to fish MFA without no one is really <laughs> taking care. Maybe even then the user is not there anymore, so we cannot report. Of course, we have some internal capabilities to do that, but they just, you know, we realize they react a bit late compared to active users. So why it's a key security um, uh, practice now to take care of this tail and, and this um, guest account uh, stale uh, account in the tenant. So this is why then we implement in, in, in the right part of the journey this concept of recertification finally, which is going also help a lot when we talk about compliance and when we go talk about audit and maybe NIST or um, for the um, for Europe and for us the um, the GDPR compliance where you have to report all the access you grant to all the users in the organization so with that it's just going to be a matter of running a report everything is 
done and already prepared for for us so we see clearly here a huge benefit for you know for for different aspects in, in the organization from it from the security team but mainly also for the end users that is going to have a really much more enjoyable journey rather than just waiting that these accounts are going to be added to some groups so with that jason if you can change the slide i also prepare what is what we love to uh, to do with these JML scenarios? So this is the classic joiner scenario. Of course, uh, this is just an example that uh, I would love to share with all of you. Where we, uh, in this specific case, we rely on Workday's integration, which is one partner uh, in the Entra suite. Of course, we have a uh, constantly uh, running an increasing number of partners managing this application in the Entra suite, but uh, we also release the API inbound provisioning capabilities where actually you can just use an API calls or the scheme protocol in order to do that easily uh, in the Entra. So if you, if you have a well-known brand for the HR system, fine, but we can even start with uh, some basic CSV file and, and feed this data in the Entra ID. So what we could do then, since we are getting this information from the HR uh, solution, we can start to do some pre-hire action before the hiring date. Like, you know, we can create the user and start to send some emails. And of course, as you can see in the first row, in, more or less in the middle, we have this huge and uh, powerful integration with Logic Apps. So with that, actually, we open in an endless option available for this kind of scenarios where I have customer, for instance, um, letting these users request an hardware to the service now request, for instance, the like you know two weeks uh, uh, before the hiring date. So they are going to have the new laptop just right the first day in the company, which is really really a nice start. Um, of course, you know security is always a priority for us. So we have the possibility to kind of pre-stage the the access the MFA profile with the TAP option that we have also in the entry ID. We can cooperate with it. We, we and of course we you, we can even keep the new employees managers up to date with all the stages, so they know what the new people are doing in which stage they are. Of course, then you can just keep you know reiterate the process the iron date so the first day in the company we can start to like you know the windows zero the windows enrollment or assigning uh, access packages or pre-stage access based on the department based on the on the role as you can see how then this entire you know scenario is going to benefit the user experience and simplify the management, of course, compared to old days where we had to add groups, a <laughs> uh, user to groups or, or team sites. So with that, uh, Jason, if you can change slide for me. Thank you very much. This is another example that I would like to share with all of you, which is even more powerful and I love more than the joiner scenario, which is the lever. Uh, why that? Because of course, this is where we can reduce this this footprint, where we can even uh, manage the termination of the user, regardless if it's an internal or a guest account, uh, because this is where we see the huge value in the, in the security posture management. Because this, with that, we can kind of immediately remove all the permission for certain users based on again attributes for instance or, or on-demand uh, workflows that we can run within uh, within the solution and so with that now we finally also release well it's still in public in private preview but now we finally have, have also the option to do, to do that for the on-prem active directory as well so it means that we can extend this capability even for the uh, lovely active directory that we have that we have on-prem so with that you can see how easy it is just because i just translated the steps that we have in the tool in this slide so you can see that it's super easy to do that and uh, you know as i said with logic apps we are going to have an endless option list of options available for these liver scenarios and also uh, we know that these things can happen. Uh, it's called the, emer the emergency termination. This is where, of course, you have to immediately terminate an account within an organization. So it's, of course, a real-time um, a real time um, uh, workflow. But with just one click, we can completely close the account and remove all the, the associated permission, including membership on-prem, which is going to be super powerful. Um, uh, so with that, I think Jason, you can you can change the slide for me once again, please. 
Uh, of course, uh, as I said super quickly, we also um, enforced our, we also, you know, use our effort to improve the review and certification part. This is where we also announced and we are going to be uh, even more powerful the integration with Security Copilot for Identity, where we can now finally leverage also this Security Copilot in order to simplify their certification and also the review part for the owners of the group or owners of the application where we can insight some really nice powerful uh, finding using these uh, copilot capabilities that we have uh, now also in, in the intro suite and this is going to be of course a key uh, point in our uh, in our journey where we do a certification and we check if this uses they still require access and we can also of course react on some specific scenarios and of course we have history and uh, you know native support for b2b collaboration so this is where we can really also do uh, an important you know step further in the security posture management with that, Jason, once again, please, if you can change the slide for me. Um, you know, we love changing uh, names and we love to introduce new portals. So I will encourage all of you to open your entry portal and see the new dashboard available there. It's uh, still in public preview, means that you can access right now for free and see what what kind of insight we have to share with you and how we are working and you know, all the announcement and all the updates that we have in the governance ecosystem for all of you. So with that, I think we can change the slide and, and over back to Jason, right? Thank you. I'll try that without the mute. <laughs> um, so, thank you for that. Um, I think so. That shows us where some of the My new pleasure. moving parts and some of the new tools coming in from Microsoft are. Um, and to try and get people back to that landscape, where do we start? One of the things that we've started doing with ITC is we, we, we do everything on a discovery basis now. So, Unless you've got a very, very clear idea of what you need and what you're trying to achieve, which well, that's great, that's 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 brilliant when 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 you when you have that. If you're not sure, one of the things that we can do is we 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 will run you through what we would call a maturity assessment, where we would look at a standard set of controls. We look at your needs, your priorities, what you're telling us you're attempting to do within business, uh, and then we produce a, a report at the end which tells you where you're strong, where you're weak, where you might want to do some emergency work, but also gives you a an idea of a roadmap of how you can achieve better identity uh, going forward. Uh, and just as an example of one of these um, the, the, these roadmaps, um, you know, this was a customer's path to improving their governance. They were a small finance-based organization. Um, not very many seats, about 200 users all in. So JML wasn't an urgent priority for them, but governance was taking up probably about, about a week of effort every month. So there was a really big goal to try and improve their, their governance posture. So obviously, we go for the quick wins. Let's start turning on multi-factor authentication. Um, I know it's not a silver bullet, but it does solve a lot of problems very, very quickly. And equally, turning on the privileged identity management. So we're removing those really, really high value accounts and permissions, not only within Entra itself, but also within some of the applications themselves. If I can take somebody out of a group and say they are entitled to be a payment authorizer, but they're not a payment authorizer unless they go through a PIM gateway, that, again, it reduces the risk of somebody compromising the account and signing checks. Shorter term, we've introduced the access reviews because, again, what we want to do is start checking. Does Bob have this? Does Bob still need this? Bob's changed teams three times since we, we allocated that. And this is something we see a lot in public sector where people will join in one role. They will have a 30-year career even today. Um, and they will have done four different, five different, six different roles over the course of that career, but they've still got permissions they had one day one. And then we'll start to also look at things like foundational JML. Let's just get better metadata into the system. 
because once we've got better metadata, it improves our ability to make the decisions. It allows us to take things like dynamic groups and start saying, well, actually, everybody in the finance team gets this set of basic applications. We'll, we'll worry about permissions later. We'll do those individually or through access group packages. But we'll, we can do the base level things quickly and easily just by virtue of the fact that HR says that they're in that particular group. And again, this means that the user doesn't need to request it. The manager doesn't need to chase it or approve it. And we don't need to worry about it because we've done it once. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a much smoother ride. And it enables us all to go and do something far more interesting and useful. We can expand the access reviews. And then over time, we can start to bring in some of the lifecycle management workflows that, that Matteo was, was talking about. Because again, this wasn't an urgent priority for this particular customer, but they could see the value longer term. And again, once you've got better metadata in place, so you know actually this user will start in a fortnight, this user will leave in a month's time, you can start to put these very simple workflows in place, some very complicated workflows in place, but you know they don't have to be complex. And one of the things which is worth mentioning is there's a lot of these are actually provided as a catalog out of the box. So there's a lot of standard common scenarios covered, um, which makes it a lot easier to go, actually, I just need to be told a week before somebody leaves, just so I can go and make sure that their, their line manager knows, IT know that they're going to have to go and recover a laptop, um, and we know there's somebody there to, to do, the, do the exit interview. We can start to put those things in place very, very quickly, very, very simply. Looking at a recent project that we, we've actually just delivered over the last couple of weeks, um, this was a, a multinational fashion retailer. They only have an E3 license, so they don't have access to some of the more exotic tools. Yeah, we're having those conversations with them. But they do have access to things like this Workday provisioning app. So we've hooked their Workday system into on-premises AD. We've used Microsoft Identity Manager, because again, they didn't have access to the lifecycle workflows at this point, to tidy up around the loose edges and deal with some of those those life cycle quality of life issues and obviously we're then using azure sync to publish this this account their accounts to the cloud but we know they've got good metadata now so the way that we built this was each individual package is actually simple it's doing one thing it fills a known purpose it connects one thing to one other thing so the workday provisioning app literally scoops up users from their workday hr pushes them into Active Directory, and it will update selected attributes. Have they changed name? Have they changed role? Are they leaving anytime soon? And then we don't worry about anything else. Everything else happens downstream. This means that each package delivers some value. It's not a monolithic one size fits all, one package does everything solution. But because we're focusing on single band, simple band, function each package delivers some value quite quickly which means we can do a workday integration in days not weeks or you know if you've got a really complicated scenario i've spent months building these particularly with uh, workday and sap the fact that this a lot of the connectivity a lot of the plumbing and the wiring is actually there out of the box and then all we need to do is go actually this attribute needs to go over here which is the easy part makes things much, much simpler, far more repeatable, far easier to get into and tweak if you need to. You don't need somebody like me to come in and set this up. You can do this in a lab quite quickly yourselves. If you've got complex scenarios and com complex requirements, yes, you might need some assistance, but you can actually do a lot of this very, very quickly without a lot of specialist um, knowledge which gives us that next thing. Because we are trying to take more advantage of commodity skills, it's a lot easier to get somebody who understands Entra and Azure and Logic Apps than it is to find somebody with MIM experience. Plus, these are modern skills. I'm expecting in another few years, I will be crossing MIM off and saying, actually, I, I just don't do that anymore. Um, you know, that, that's what I did five years ago, 10 years ago. But I now work exclusively in Logic Apps. 
these skills are much easier to get hold of. They're a lot more of a commodity basis. So you're more likely to have them in-house already, easier to recruit for, easier to train for. They're, they're, a, lot, they're a lot closer to off the shelf. And because we've separated out the purpose of each individual step, I've got a user coming into the system. That's the workday. I've got a user going from on-prem to the cloud. That's the Azure sync. I'm tidying up the loose edges with the, um, with the, you know, I'm changing the, um, you know, the user creation for the cell account name and the user principal name. If I have an issue or I need to make a change, I know where I'm looking. I'm not having to wade through hundreds of thousands of lines of code or configuration. I can go to the piece of the puzzle that needs to move and change. The other benefit here is it is modular. We have a workday subsidiary that's due to come online at some point later in the year. Um, or I'd say it's a workday subsidiary. This, this, this company have a subsidiary that they're bringing into the mix. When they are ready to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in an additional workday provisioning app. We won't touch the original. It doesn't need to know about the subsidiary HR system. We will plug in a new version of the workday app that will sit alongside the existing one. It will push the users into the on-premises AD and then nothing else needs to change. It's a modular system. We've already spoken to this particular organization about their future plans and their move to go to cloud first. So at some point, probably not this year, but in the future, they're looking to get rid of their on-premise footprint. In the meantime, what we can talk to them about, what we have spoken to them about is actually, let's look at changing this Workday app. So instead of going to on-premise Active Directory, Let's go directly to the cloud. If we can do that, and then we can use the identity lifecycle workflows to do all of the tiny bits and pieces, birthright access, tidying up user account names that MIM's currently doing, we can turn off MIM and we haven't destroyed, we haven't removed a huge sunk cost. You know, it's a stepping stone along the way, along that greater journey. And we are free to do that because actually, we don't want to have um, somebody uh, C-suite level say, what do you mean you've just turned off £300,000 worth of work? You know, we, we don't have that level of technical debt to worry about. We can turn these things on and off quickly, easily, and we can adapt the solutions a lot more flexibly moving forward. Just digging into the way that we do tend to do these, we build up these work packages because, again, these are the work units that we're, that we're working to now. So for the Workday provisioning app, again, you can see here, I've got, here's the purpose. This is all it's doing. This is all I want it to do. It's got a scope with bounds of responsibility because, again, I don't want it to be able to bleed over into other functions. Or could we just... Um, used to be the, the the death of MIM projects going you know, back into the years where the question, can it be done in MIM, is usually yes. Should it be done in MIM? Very rarely gets asked. Whereas now we can say, actually, that doesn't live in this work module. That would need to go somewhere else. But that's fine. We can plug in an additional module if we need to. We've got the dependencies. We've got an estimate of effort. Um, now, this one says 10 days. Realistically, when you're looking at all the different workshops, to agree all the different sessions, building designs, testing, implementing it in development environments, going through CAD processes, these things do take time to go into a production environment. I'm not going to lie to you about that and say, you can do this in an afternoon. You could. I really wouldn't, but you could. Um, because it's identity. If you get this wrong, you know, carnage can be unleashed very, very quickly. But we treat it with respect. We don't want to downplay it. But equally, we're not going to say this is a six-month engagement. It's not. It doesn't need to be, and it shouldn't be. And again, because we're doing this here, we have similar work packages for the MIM component that we saw, which, again, wasn't massive for the Azure Sync and for the dynamic groups. And again, we do this. We help the, user, the end users and the customers get set up. And then hopefully, at the end of the day, they can look after these things themselves. So going back to our common challenges, hopefully we can see it doesn't have to be expensive. I can put in things like this. You can put in things like this. You don't need necessarily expensive consultants to come in. Um, you know, 
if you need help, great, come and talk to us. But equally, this doesn't need to be an 18-month project. You might spend 18 months, but you might spend 18 months doing two weeks, three weeks, a month, putting in key, key blocks. We're too small to need this. Size doesn't matter. There are elements to the micro and elements to the identity stack that you may still need. Um, at 100 seats, we don't get a huge amount of benefit from JML at ITC. But we do get a lot of benefit from having good metadata because that then allows us to control our security posture, which is really critical for the work that we do as a managed service provider. And hopefully we can now see that actually it isn't too hard. We've moved away from the specialist skill set into more of a commodity thing. We don't have time right now. We don't need 18 months anymore. You can do something about this quite quickly. There are elements of this that you could do today without a huge amount of planning, particularly around some of the downs, you know, the dynamic groups, for example. You can use those. They then assign licenses or they assign permission blocks and they will work to a greater or lesser extent based on your um, metadata, which means, yes, you probably want JML at some point, but actually you could do that over time. It doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be everything all at once. And hopefully you can see, actually, we might have tried to do this in the past, but that need to do a big project, you know, an 18 month, a two year monstrosity. Hopefully this will give you that appetite to go, actually, this is worth another look. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. And I'll move on to the next. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Matteo. Um, I think the guys have managed to really help uh, demystify some of the complexity attached to the challenges surrounding managing modern identities. Um, I'll try and summarise some of the key takeaways. I think there's a lot in there, um, but I think there were some some key themes. Um, back to Jason's quotes, I think, uh, early in the, in the webinar, identity being the new control plane, um, that real concept of moving the perimeter from the network edge to the concept of identity being being the perimeter um, it can be a complicated journey i think um, you know partners like microsoft uh, have invested in the governance side very heavily with the entry suite um, which helps really break break down the identity life cycle into chunks and manage those sort of chunks in 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 efficient ways um, identity as a life cycle never ends i think that's a concept that that makes true and sound sense identities are continually interrogated and monitored throughout every step of the life cycle. Um, I think one of the one of the gents mentioned, you know, being uh, implementing frictionless or or simple solutions, which <clears throat> encourages businesses to a adopt them and, and b I think users to engage with them. Um, the mapping of user ju user journeys, as as Matteo helpfully demonstrated, you know, really helps streamline the experience for the end user and keeps the entire process secure. <coughs> so the concept of self service, um, this is where the streamlining happens, where those integrations with the HR systems to service now for provisioning requests and so on really helps bring bring the process to life and engages with users. I think the joiner and lever scenarios that Matteo uh, shared um, uh, re really, really useful in terms of especially the lever scenarios where there's an opportunity to reduce the risk footprint, as, as Matteo mentioned, um, extending to security posture management, really key. And I think the the, the logic app capability can uh, really bring some power to de defining the workflows, which provides, in Matteo's words, endless options for joiner and lever scenarios specific to, to each organisation. And then we did have a mention of Security Copilot. I think you know, this can really now start to help drive access reviews through the entry suite of solutions, really through intelligent recommendation from Copilot, which is based on uh, machine learning and some of those LLMs and sign-in history, which is where that can really start augmenting uh, SOCs and analysts to, uh, to, to drive the right actions and outcomes for clients. And then back to Jason's uh, last few slides there, the quick wins, such as you know, implementing MFA, privileged identity management, lifecycle management, uh, linked to uh, what Matteo, Matteo described, breaking down the identity lifecycle journey into manageable, manageable modular chunks, which allows us to, 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 to step through those uh, as individualistic uh, businesses with, with different needs and contexts. So uh, with that attempt to summarise, I guess with that, we'll share the second uh, poll question at this stage, um, the, uh, the penultimate question. 
Do you think you could benefit now from implementing a solution as demonstrated on the call today? So another 10 to 20 seconds, please, to give that some thought and provide your answers. OK, just starting to see some of the responses coming through. I think it's uh, always useful. I think I think it's fair, fair and honest for those that are saying no. I think you, you probably kind of got to the point where you know you know what you're doing, but hopefully you took some benefit away. But really a strong response. Uh, yes, you know, so so back to the first response to the first question. Could you know you have a JML process in place? Could you do more to streamline it? The answer is 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 clearly resounding rest, yes here, and at least a, a considering thinking about it. So I think there's definitely some opportunity to to to, to do some deeper exploration there. Um, so thank you, thank you for your responses. I think what we'll do now is move into the Q and A section. So I'm aware that we do have some uh, uh, questions in the chat function, and I think we have one in sorry, one in the Q and A function, and one in also the chat. So we'll start. We'll start with the chat. Um, Garen said, need, "Need to learn more. Can we have good white paper on how to set up a higher risk for people about to leave, and the easiest way to set up high risk uh, uh, data loss prevention action?" Yes, absolutely. That that's something we can we can take away, Garen, and uh, and and certainly consider to provide some 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 thought leadership and context around that specific ask. Just to just to the questions. Um, let's move into the questions. Um, we've talked about you've talked about Just JML. Do, um, Mandy, we've, we've got another one um, further up the the, the chat window saying uh, is uh, is Logic Apps doing a lot of heavy lifting in this process? Sorry, you're quite right. Uh, from Mark from Mark Hall. Um, Ma Mattia, did you did you want to handle handle that that answer? Sorry, just on mute. Still on mute, <laughs> Mattia. You say I, I I I I can jump in on this one if needs be. Um, for, for, from our perspective, it's a, it yeah. depends. Um, you can do an awful lot with Logic Caps if you want to, right? Um, because all Logic Caps is doing is it's it's it's, it's dealing with things on a on an eventful or a scheduled basis. So I've seen something change on the user, I will now react accordingly. You can put a lot of functionality there if you want to. If you have additional other things already in place or you wanted to do this through other avenues you could mm. because mm. the identities are still subject to things like graph right so it's about finding the right solution for you logic apps has a unique advantage in that it gives you that consistent interface and that consistent approach and one of the things which um, you know one of the battle scars of um, many um, identity projects um, you know, in the past is Having that ability to simplify things and say, I know where to go and look for this piece of functionality. I've used good naming in my rules. I've used good process to go. Each logic app is doing one thing rather than, you know, I've got a new starter logic app where it deals with 15 scenarios. Um, yeah, so that kind of discipline can really, really help you make things very, very supportable um, rather than, you know, you know, some of the legacy systems I've worked on where it's like I've got an 8,000 line block of code that's a single if then else switch that somebody's built i've got now got to go and troubleshoot um so so it 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 it, it really is it's like all things identity everything's an edge case you know it, it depends from my perspective but matthew yeah sorry i wasn't trying to say something but i was on mute so apologies for no that worries. but yeah the question is that of course logic app is a key aspect here key factor in the game we have to always bear in mind that we now support scheme and as well user user provisioning uh, for LDAP, for instance, and on-prem application as well. Of course, we rely on Logic Apps when we have such integration that has to run on, you know, um, in, in specific flows uh, or maybe where we don't have, you know, a, a connector out of the box, like when we talk about for instance, some old legacy LDAP application. Uh, and if you want to write something on an LDAP directory, then we have to engage a logic app that helps uh, uh, to streamline and simplify the process. But um, with the scheme integration and the new user um, provisioning capabilities within the new Cloud Connector agent, this is going to be like, you know, 
creating an enterprise hub, non, nothing more than that. So we won't end up having this com complex, uh, uh, you know, logic app that then in the end, when you are going to have you no know, thousand of them is going unmanageable. It's just that we need this engine uh, in the specific situations, but definitely uh, not nothing compared to meme days. Mm. Uh, some real some real power to be harnessed with the with the logic <laughs> apps. Um, just coming back to the, the questions, uh, I think Sapphire answered. Mike, mm -hmm. will a recording be available to download? Absolutely, yes. We'll make sure you get a copy of that. Um, are there any best practices or gotchas for managing access permissions during employee role transitions? Uh, perhaps, Matteo, do you want to start start with that one? Yeah, I can start that one right uh, right off the box. We now support this on demand uh, um, flow uh, workflow that can be run based on a, a, an attribute change. Uh, so it means that when a specific attributes in the user is going to be from marketing or to HR or whatever is going to be the change, then we can trigger um, uh, on demand the change. We have also some important new updates coming in, into the specific scenario of movers uh, because we are realized that this is just not enough for, for now. Uh, so, of course, we are going now to integrate with other uh, solution for data for data protection as well, where we can then offer the option to run a specific uh, workflow based, for instance, to uh, labeling capabilities uh, in the DLP as well, and also in the compliance model. So it's st we still have some work to do there, but then really we already have a powerful capabilities out of the box. Thank you, Matteo. Just stepping through, we do have a few more questions to get through. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about JML from a user perspective. How does this apply to service accounts and non-human actors? Jason, do you want to start with this one? Wow. Yeah, so I, I think the thing is everything we talked about today has a very human centric um, focus. Um, you know, the, the entry API gateways are for, for provisioning end user accounts. Um, but there's still a lot of tools in the box where we could actually say if you have a source of truth, such as a, um, you know, um, you know, a, a ticketing system, I forget the name of it already, um, or an asset management system that you're using where you can request a service account, that can then go to Azure and create service principles. So again, you've got that central record. All of the principles that we use for identity management still apply and should still apply to non-human actors. Who, you know, what is it? What is it there for? Why does it have the access it needs? And then bringing that into the on-premise world we can then use some of the tools matteo mentioned um or you know we can even stick with things like mim if we need to to convert that into an on-premise service account and then put that into the right place give it the right permissions and then let that loose into the world and at that point we've also got additional tooling available to us through partner organizations to start putting things like swim lanes so some of the modern protections that our cloud users enjoy we could also apply back onto on things like on-premise service accounts if we needed to. That's good. Good answer. I mean, are there, are there any solutions out there that can um, provide controls like MFA to things like service accounts and non-human non actors? Do you think? Yeah. So, uh, so, so we we do work with an organisation called Silverfort who actually do offer that, as well as being able to to do some um, so, some on-premise shenanigans around user MFA for um, things which aren't normally protected. So we have PowerShell, remote access, remote desktop, file shares, that kind of thing. Uh, Thanks, but Jason. sticking back to today's, you know, yes, you should be looking at protecting your non-human actors just the same way that you protect your users because they are, for the same reasons that you know, Matteo mentioned about levers, because there isn't a human being attached to them, they are seen as high-value targets by, by attackers. Absolutely. Question from Chris Dornan. Uh, on slide 18, you talked about a company that would be in a position to move to cloud native in a year's time. However, to save sunk cost by changing to a cloud first provisioning and removing uh, Active Directory sync, how are you doing the on-prem element if you're going cloud first while you still require hybrid? Matteo, do you want to um, start with that one? Or Jason? I was going to say, if you needed to, I mean, we've got MIM in play. We can use MIM to go, actually, we'll stop bringing user accounts back the other way. 
Azure Sync has some capabilities there as well, um, which are worth looking at, particularly around getting groups back onto premises. Um, although there are some quirks to that, which mean that it's, it's not always appropriate. So I think depending on the exact need and the exact ask, you've actually got all the tools in play that you need to imp on that particular scenario, they're ready. Um, and all of these things um, actually sit within that E3 license as is. So, you know, MIM, for example, that's already included. Um, you know, the, the synchronization component is already included with your E3. Everything else is there. So it's, you know, you can do it. Um, we have done that in other organizations where they've had very, very, shall we say, unique requirements. Um, is that that wasn't, you know, generally we tend to be pushing user accounts in the other direction, but certainly it's something we could be looking at doing, particularly if you're looking at allowing your Active Directory to be in managed decline. So we don't need to bring everybody back on to the on premise. We only really need to bring back selected users. So right. we can start to, again, just improve that security context by saying, actually, we just don't have as big an attack surface because we've removed three quarters of our users from that, that state. Really good Sorry. answer. Thank you, Jason. Just conscious of time, I think we do have time for one more final question uh, from Ryan McCul uh, McCulloch. Uh, how do offerings differ between different HR platform uh, platforms, i.e. our examples uh, mentioned Workday? What would you recommend for investigating SAP SUFAR capabilities? Perhaps, uh, Matthew or Jason, any, any experience there? Any, any recommendations we can make? Yeah, well, I can and just comment on this. Of course, we have an, um, a public list with all the integration already available for the entry ID, which means that we have some well-known brands, including SIP, uh, providing some uh, preset of connectors already available for the governance part, well, mainly for the HR integration. Uh, but we also offer an uh, a API driven connector uh, using Skin protocol in order to do even though custom integration or, or integration through uh, the Skin protocol for custom API as well. So I would definitely suggest to go through this list that I, I can even share. It's public. It's a public document and see what we can offer in the gallery. And if it's not there, then we can always rely on the API driven connector, which is actually basically it's like an empty connector that you can just fill with all the your needs, uh, supporting always the scheme protocol, of course. Excellent. And, 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 and having done a bit of work with that recently, it is mm -hmm. literally just the existing HR um, connectors, which I'm used to using through for Workday and Success Factors. Um, which are the out of the box ones, which are common in the Microsoft world. It's just that, but without the HR components built in. So we just fill in that blank. Correct. And then everything else goes back to exactly the way it is before. So again, it's very, very simple to just fill in one blank. I'm just doing one thing at one time. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. I think that brings to a close our Q&A section. Uh, we've got just about enough time for our very final web poll question. Uh, which will just appear on your screens in a moment. Just wait for those answers to come through. OK, uh, so we've certainly got some interesting parties that would like a follow up call for those um, that, that wouldn't. Hopefully, hope you've got some good takeaways and some insight from from this webinar, but certainly we'll be we'll be following for all that responded, following up with everyone. And for those that responded, I need more details or yes, happy to happy to provide some time with one of our experts uh, on, on the call uh, as by, by way of follow up. Um, so I guess now before we bring this uh, webinar to an end, uh, we'll be following up with each of you by email, as mentioned. However, in the meantime, please can we ask you to complete the feedback form, which you'll see appearing in the chat. Um, this takes less than a minute to do and enables us to better tailor our future events for you. Um, and if you'd like to keep up to date with ITC Secure, please give us a follow on our LinkedIn page. Uh, again, that'll be uh, the post to, sorry, the link to that will be uh, shared in the chat. But for now, uh, I'll say uh, a huge thank you to Matteo and Jason uh, for joining. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and thank you to everyone for logging in uh, this, this morning, uh, stroke afternoon. We hope you enjoyed the session um, and goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.